So in part one, I talked about Visenya from birth to 1 AC, stopping just after Aegon's conquest of the Seven Kingdoms where he took all the realms but the Iron Islands and Dorne. Aegon's conquest was so important, AC or Aegon's conquest became how they measured the years afterwards. Aegon, with the help of his sisters, had officially united the Seven Kingdoms, most of the Seven Kingdoms, into one great realm. He then returned to where he had originally landed, later to be known as King's Landing, and raised up a new town, ruling from a great metal seat made from the twisted and broken blades of his foes. But this video isn't about Aegon. So in this video, part two, let's talk about Visenya's role as one of the queens of the Seven Kingdoms, the first Dornish War, which ended in absolute disaster, and how she shaped the early Targaryen rule. In 1 AC, at the age of 29, Visenya became one of the queens of the Seven Kingdoms, along with her double sister Rhaenys, who was about 25 years old at the time. Of course, both of their husband and king was Aegon, who was about 27 years old. Aegon had decided that he would rule from Aegon Fort, where he had landed, and the new city growing around it became known as King's Landing. Because, as you know, George R. R. Martin is really creative with names. This royal city, crowded, muddy, and stinking, and always full of activity, rose up around Aegon Fort and would grow to surpass the great cities of Old Town and even Lannisport. Visenya even got her own hill, named Visenya's Hill, where a Grand Sep was built by money given by the High Septon. This Grand Sep replaced the original makeshift cog one on the Blackwater that had served the common people. At Aegon Fort, sitting on his iron throne made from the swords of those he conquered, Aegon now faced the tremendous challenge of ruling the new realm he had forged together. A realm full of kingdoms that had been constantly at war with each other and even with themselves for thousands of years. Luckily, Rainies and her supportive singers helped their reputation quite a bit. Singers made songs praising the Targaryen rulers, and throughout the realm, others heard these songs and began to believe the hype. While Visenya may have thought singers and bards were a waste of time, she didn't complain about the songs that made them appear even better and all worthy in the eyes of those in their new realm. Even when some of those songs contain some pretty big lies about how amazing the Targaryens were. Aegon further helped knit the realm together by going on his royal progresses where he would put awe, and fear if needed, into his new subjects. While he made these progresses six months out of every year, he left the day-to-day -day running of the realm to his sisters and most trusted counselors. This did wonders for the Targaryen relations with the rest of the realm. But there was a bigger problem that Aegon, and therefore Visenya and Rhaenys, had to deal with. The realm he forged together, well wasn't actually completely forged together. The Iron Islands were in a state of chaos after the Targaryens had killed Heron the Black, and Dorne still refused to submit. In knitting more of the realm together, it was time in 2 AC to bring the Iron Islands into the fold, even if the majority of the Seven Kingdoms really, really hated the Ironborn. Which Aegon did successfully, and the Iron Islands was folded into his new kingdom. But this wasn't good enough for Aegon. He wanted Dorne to come into his new realm as well. This led to the First Dornish War in 4 AC, a war that would take away the thing Aegon loved the most and end in absolute disaster. So in 4 AC, Aegon turned his eye back to Dorne and wanted to finally conquer them. The Dornish were smart in that they didn't fight any battles against the Targaryens, at least not in the traditional sense. Instead, Dorne learned from watching what Aegon and his sisters had done to the rest of the Seven Kingdoms during his initial conquest. Instead of fighting, they disappeared, ambushing the Targaryen forces and then disappearing back from where they came. The Dornish didn't hold their castles, and the Targaryen siblings were mostly met with a ghost town. Well, Rhaenys and Aegon. By all accounts, Visenya wasn't part of this initial attack. They thought they had taken Dorne successfully in the initial war, and appointed their own men to watch over Dorne as they returned to King's Landing. Well, Dorne was anything but secure. Shortly after Aegon and Rhaenys returned to King's Landing, they heard that the Dornish lords had rebelled against the Targaryens, and the men they placed in Dorne to rule it. By 5 AC, Lord Tyrell, who was in charge of putting down revolts, disappeared in the sands with his entire army, just 
gone. Entire garrisons of the Targaryen men were mutilated and tortured in horrific ways. In 7 AC, the Targaryen's men that were captured and not killed during the rebellion were ransomed back for each man's weight in gold. But they were each missing their sword hands, so to never take up arms against Dorne again. Understandably, this pissed the Targaryens off. Aegon and his siblings set fire to the castles that refused to submit over and over. The Dornish responded by, well, also burning things. On the third time the Targaryens released their dragons on Dorne, tragedy struck for their family. Unfortunately, Rhaenys died during this time in 10 AC when her dragon was shot down over Hellholt. The death of Rhaenys during this war caused the two years afterwards to be labeled the Dragon's Wrath. Both Aegon and Visenya, devastated at the loss of their sister, took their dragons and set every castle, keep, and holdfast in Dorne, besides Sunspear in the Shadow City, on fire at least once. It is thought Sunspear was spared because the Targaryens feared they had anti-dragon weapons. But another thought is they did it to make the rest of Dorne believe the Martells had paid for their own safety and abandoned the rest of Dorne. If that actually was their plan, it, it didn't work out the way they thought it would. Not only that, but Visenya and Aegon put prices on the heads of Dornish lords, resulting in six plus Dornish lords being killed by assassins. But it was this action that also made the Dornish send their own killers in return, which led to even more bloodshed. This resulted in Visenya and Aegon being targeted quite a few times. In one case, Visenya and her escort were attacked and two of her guards were slain before she cut down the last of the attackers with her sword Dark Sister. And many others met gruesome fates from the Dornish assassins. Now, and this might sound terrible to say, despite a lot of bloodshed coming from this last part of the Dornish War, there was also some good. It resulted in the formation of the King's Guard. So in 10 AC, Aegon would be happy to have Visenya by his side again. In the streets of King's Landing, Aegon and Visenya were both attacked, and if not for Visenya and her sword Dark Sister, Aegon may not have survived. Despite this attack, and his sister likely being the only reason he survived, Aegon was convinced that his guards were enough to protect him. Visenya let him know otherwise when Aegon pointed to his guardsmen, and Visenya quickly pulled out Dark Sister and cut Aegon's cheek before the guards could even react. She scolded him, your guards are slow and lazy. To which Aegon was kind of forced to agree. Thus, Visenya went about creating the King's Guard. She decided that there would be seven champions, all knights, because Aegon ruled the Seven Kingdoms. Again, it was just a title, let's not argue about how many kingdoms he did rule at this time. It's a boring argument and it's already been answered, so. It's kind of pointless at this point. So to ensure their loyalty was only to Aegon, she modeled the King's Guard vows like those of the Night's Watch. Those who served to protect Aegon would have no other loyalty, not to their house, not to their lands, not to their wife, or any children. While Aegon wanted to decide the members of his King's Guard through a grand tourney, thankfully Visenya talked him out of it. She instead told him he needed more than skill and arms to protect him. He needed absolute loyalty. Aegon listened to her and allowed Visenya to select the first members of the King's Guard. Maester seemed to agree he was wise in letting Visenya do so. Of the original King's Guard picked by her, two died defending Aegon, and all served to the end of their days with nothing short of honor. Thankfully, the Dornish War ended in 13 AC when Princess Maria of Dorne died and her aged son took over. The Prince of Dorne wanted nothing to do with the war and instead sent a delegation to King's Landing, led by his daughter, carrying the skull of Moraxis, which had been Rainey's dragon. Once at court, many did not like this gift. Visenya was one of those people, though others had a stronger reaction than her. Despite the anger over this gift, Aegon instead listened to the Dornish party's words. However, it was a private letter given to Aegon, and only read by him, that resulted in a peace treaty between Dorne and his kingdom. What did this letter say? If I had to bet something about Rhaenys, or that his son would be next. Now, I want to rewind a bit to 11 AC, while the first Dornish war was still going on. After a decade of marriage, 
Visanya had not had a child with Aegon, which is a long time to not conceive. This began whispers that she was barren and would forever remain childless. Others, being a bit more bold, suggested that Aegon should put Visenya aside and take a different wife. After all, Rhaenys was dead, and what did Aegon need with a woman incapable of childbirth? To that end, a lot of pretty young women were presented to Aegon by noble knights and great lords. Each was said to be more comely than the last, but as we saw throughout his life, Aegon never strayed from his sister wives. He may have thought about it, but he never went through with it. But due to Aegon keeping his thoughts on the matter to himself, we may never know how much he thought of setting Visenya aside for another bride. Which he may have, especially as the years went on and he seemed to dislike her more and more. Luckily for Visenya, she announced in 11 AC she was pregnant with a son, something she proclaimed confidently. Turns out she was absolutely right about the son bit. The next year, Magor, Aegon's second son and child, was born on Dragonstone four years after Rhaenys had given Aegon Aene. From the birth of Megor, Visenya would be his greatest ally, constantly trying to advance him above her nephew stepson, Aenys. Which is exactly what we'll talk about in the final part, part 3. Visenya raising Megor, allegedly killing her nephew stepson, and how her ambition made the realm bleed. So thank you for watching, please come back for part 3 coming soon. Then I'll put all three parts together in one long video at the request of my lovely patrons on Patreon. Please like, subscribe, and come back for more videos.